my name is Dick Boak. Uh, I run artist relations, publicity, uh, and have had a lot to do with the Martin Museum. The museum was the brainchild of uh, Chris Martin. Uh, we had wanted to do it for a long time, and finally, finally we had the chance, and, and uh, Chris seized upon it, and the results have been uh, fantastic. Um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the history of the Martin Guitar Company and the, and the Martin family. And uh, I know Chris Martin will fortify this story himself uh, a little later on. But basically, um, at the age of 15, C.F. Martin Sr. Uh, was uh, interested in woodworking. He had studied in his father's shop in Markneukirchen, Germany, on the border of Poland. And um, at the age of 15, his father sent him off to Austria, Germany to study in the, in the, in the shop of Johann Stauffer. Stauffer was the, the uh, uh, leading guitar maker of, of his day. The acoustic guitar was just coming into popularity around that time, around, around uh, 18, uh, 1810, 1820. And uh, uh, C.F. Martin Sr. did great um, in the Stauffer factory. He rose very quickly to the position of foreman in Stauffer's plant. Eventually, he met uh, his wife-to-be, uh, uh, Ottilie Kuhl, the, the daughter of Carl Kuhl, who was also um, a, an instrument maker. Um, and he decided that he wished to uh, move back to his hometown of Mark Neukirchen, which he did. And he uh, intended to set up a guitar shop in, in his hometown. The problem was that the uh, uh, Violin makers uh, that lived in Mark Neukirchen had a very well established guild. The guild was very much like a labor union, and they didn't uh, wish uh, Martin to set up a shop uh, to make instruments. They considered the guitar to be a piece of furniture and not a viable musical instrument. And so, <clears throat> a, uh, an argument and eventually a court battle ensued where they tried to prevent him from building guitars. Uh, this left a, a lot of hurt feelings and a bad taste in, in uh, the Martin family. Um, and uh, they eventually, uh, in spite of winning the court case, they eventually decided to uh, leave Germany. Uh, they packed up uh, all of their belongings. And in the fall of 1833, they boarded a boat uh, in England and headed for the new country arriving in New York City uh, in uh, what, I, what I think was late October of 1833. They found a, uh, a German-speaking community on Hudson Street near where the mouth of the Holland Tunnel is these days. And they set up shop, uh, bought a building, um, lived upstairs and, and had a storefront uh, at street level. Uh, in the early days, uh, in, in late 1833 and 1834, um, and the first several years, uh, it was more like a music store where uh, you could go in and buy violin strings or you might buy, buy a clarinet or a trombone or a flugelhorn. Most of the instruments were imported from Germany. Uh, but at, uh, concurrently, Martin set up his uh, guitar making shop and, and immediately began making some very beautiful and very or ornate guitars, uh, some of which we have on display in the museum here. Um, the guitars were impeccable in their design and in their uh, level of quality, and he soon uh, took on a, 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 a very high reputation as being the finest uh, instrument maker in the United States. And so his reputation spread. Uh, the problem was that, that uh, they were quite unhappy in New York City. New York City was a very rough and tumble place uh, with uh, uh, wild animals running in the streets and, and uh, uh, street fights and, and many different uh, uh, conflicting ethnic neighborhoods. <coughs> they almost moved back to Germany. Uh, 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 C.F. Martin's wife, Otilly, was very unhappy. But fortunately, they were able to visit Nazareth. They had friends. They had friends out here in Nazareth. I believe it was a three-day stagecoach ride at the time uh, from New York to Nazareth. And, and uh, 
We know that she made the trip to visit uh, uh, friends from their hometown of Marknerkirchen that had emigrated and lived in Nazareth. When she came out here, she found a, a very uh, familiar German-speaking uh, town that reminded her very much of her hometown in Germany. And uh, after her visit, uh, we understand that she went back and read the riot act to her husband. And, and uh, very soon afterwards, uh, uh, he, he gathered all of his inventory and sold it to a firm called Ludicus and Walther in New York City sold his inventory of uh, instruments and, and packed everything up and, and uh, moved to Nazareth. Set up shop uh, just a quarter of a mile up the hill from where we are seated right now uh, in Cherry Hill. And that was in the, uh, in the year 1839. Uh, so six years in New York City, moved to Nazareth, set up shop on top of the hill, and for a period of 20 years uh, built guitars <clears throat> and uh, um, every time they needed to ship an instrument, they would have to hook up the horse and buggy and drive down the hill, up the hill, and into town uh, in order to deliver the guitars to the post office. This turned out to be uh, tedious and, and unnecessary, uh, but um, the problem was that the town of Nazareth was closed, a closed community, a Moravian commune, uh, Moravian being a, a, a German religious sect, and the Martins were not Moravians. Uh, gradually, though, they, uh, they warmed up to the town and, um, and converted to Moravianism. And in 1859, uh, they purchased a, a block of property, uh, a block, uh, one block away from the post office, which made de the delivery of guitars very easy. Um, there, on the corner of North Street and, and Main Street, they built a uh, homestead, uh, uh, which is still there. Uh, it's now the Nazareth Chamber of Commerce. Uh, even though Martin still retains the ownership of the building, the building is leased. But that became the, the, the home, and uh, uh, almost immediately they, they began construction of a factory in 1859 next to the home. Uh, the rumor was that guitars were built in the kitchen while the factory was built. Um, uh, and after the factory was completed, uh, um, uh, C.F. Martin Sr. And, and probably one or two helpers uh, from the town uh, uh, got, to, got to work building guitars. And a surprising number of guitars from 1859 uh, through the Spanish-American War adding employees and specialties and perhaps a, a, la, a, a finishing specialist or a person that was in charge of bending the sides and assembling the bodies, perhaps uh, an office employee um, um, because uh, CF Senior had been in the habit of keeping the journals uh, in the evening uh, by candlelight. <clears throat> I'm sure that became quite a job as the business grew. Uh, so. C.F. Martin passed away and his son, C.F. Jr., through the Spanish-American War and, and uh, the turn of the century, fended off uh, uh, people that tried to take over the business or, or uh, disparage the Martin name or spread rumors to the effect that Martin and Sons was no longer in business. Uh, but he did a good job. He didn't live all that long, though, and his son, Frank Henry Martin, at, at a very young age, uh, 17 or 18 or 19 years old, somewhere in, in his late teens, <clears throat> was called upon to carry on the business. And uh, he rose to the challenge, uh, started building mandolins against the uh, wishes of his distributor. And uh, as a result, he fired his distributor and took on the distri distribution of the guitars um, uh, himself and on a company level. The period of time uh, leading up to World War I and following uh, with the Great Depression, uh, Martin Guitar continued to grow in size. Uh, uh, the number of employees perhaps rose to uh, 12, 14, 16, 18 people. And the guitars were impeccable. As a matter of fact, uh, the guitars uh, 
evolved from very small instruments, uh, uh, size 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, size O, size double O, size triple O, growing in size and volume, but maintaining a, a very uh, singular vision of what a guitar should be in terms of its appearance and its tone. Frank Henry Martin uh, ran the business up uh, until around 1940 when his son C.F. Martin III uh, uh, took over and, and um, um, uh, maintained the integrity of the guitars. Uh, that was his, his uh, task and challenge. He did a great job at that and ran the company uh, into, his, into, into his 90s. Every day, uh, walking around the plant, he knew every uh, employee by name. He was very frugal and very conservative, but uh, as I said, he, he maintained the, the uh, dignity and integrity of the, of the uh, guitars. Uh, his son, Frank, built th this building and his grandson Chris uh, is currently the chairman and CEO and has uh, the integrity and, and conservatism of his grandfather while maintaining a, a much more open-mindedness to uh, alternative materials, uh, new processes, new technologies. So the company that we have today is a, a very unique blend of tradition and technology maintaining the, the designs that were developed by C.F. Martin and his, and his family, but uh, uh, bringing the company competitively into the 21st century. So it's a very special place uh, and a very special product. I always like to say that, that uh, trees, being the sacred things that they are, um, deserve to be utilized for, for very special purposes. And if, you, if trees could talk and if you could ask them what they wanted to be, I, I think they probably would answer a Martin guitar.